We've got a stabbing to the chest from the left hand side. Oh. You'll get sick and die if you don't have an operation. He's not able to make the right decisions for himself, so things might kick off. All right, hold right, please. Would you rescue me when I'm by myself? When I need your love, if I need your help, would you rescue me? There is a possibility he might die. Ah! Ah! <laughs> You're just reporting to me. I'll report to you, yeah. boss. <laughs> Jonathan thinks he's my boss and I think I'm his boss. Oh, yeah, right. Who's bossier? Well, you're definitely bossier. <laughs> but you're more my boss. Dr Emma West has 20 years' experience. The last 10 here at the Royal Melbourne Hospital as an emergency specialist. <laughs> right, so do you need any help then? <laughs> no, no, no. Underling? <laughs> no, you're okay? I love being an emergency doctor. It's really about working with people during really vulnerable times in their lives. And so, yeah, it really suits me down to a T. I love it. Emma? Yeah? Stab to the chest, two stab wounds, left lower chest. Oh, OK. They're going to be here in like seven minutes. A call has just come through from paramedics, rushing in a man who's been stabbed in a violent attack and could be bleeding to death. So let's get the room ready. We're going to go into trauma, trauma one or two. One. Trauma one. So we know that there's a man coming who's coming in police custody who's been stabbed on the left-hand side of his body. And we anticipate that things might kick off in terms of not wanting treatment, not wanting to be there, being scared, having pain. The man is under the influence of alcohol. He's extremely agitated and police are standing by. Back out, back out, back out. Okay. Uh, he says you're stabbed twice. Not sure where it happened. Went home. Think of her assess his depth of his wounds. He's uh, reluctant to take place. He's got significant pleuritic pain. Says it's sharp. Says it stops him taking deep breath. The man waited two hours after the attack before finally contacting a family member who convinced him to go to hospital. I'm going to lay him flat. Let me have a look at his heart. I don't know if the stab wound's gone into his chest or his tummy. And so that's why we're trying to get the ultrasound and figure out if he's bleeding internally. Once I've done the ultrasound, I'll sit you up, Maddie, OK? I just want to get an ultrasound of your... And I won't do that for long. To be able to figure out if he's got bleeding within his abdomen, we need to lie him flat. I'm really trying hard to get him to trust me. But this patient's really agitated, and so that is proving really difficult. Just want to tear up, please. You want to go up a bit? Yeah, All right, no problem. How about that? Maddie, I want to let you know why I want to lay you down. Because the ultrasound only works if you're laying flat. Give me the morphine. I'll give you the morphine. And then what I'm going to promise you... I'm going to get you, I'm going to get you something to suck on I in your mouth. Drink, please. This man has a lot of pain with breathing, and so I know that things have gone deeply into his body. I just can't figure out if it's into his chest or his belly. He is really scared, but I'm realising that he doesn't understand the severity and the life-threatening nature of the stab wound. We'll, we'll give you some medications.
and I don't know who'd stabbed him, but they stabbed him such that he could lead to death. Next waiting. The Royal Melbourne Hospital is home to one of Australia's biggest and busiest emergency departments. So, no, you're right. I see you looking good. <laughs> It's Dr. Mark Putland's job as director to make sure that more than 200 patients a day get the critical care they need. I'm very proud to work in emergency here. It's a fantastic place uh, and just fantastic team to work with. And the emergency department suits me well because it makes order out of chaos. And a place this size, yes, every day there's something big. Dr. Mark and his team have just been alerted to an incoming patient with severe injuries. 23-year-old Zach has been in a horror workplace accident where his right hand got trapped in factory machinery. Oh, my God. The glove of his pinky finger got caught in the rolling machine. Then he felt his hand go up and under through it. He says that his fifth finger was completely amputated. The other two are completely degloved down to the bone. By the time paramedics arrived, Zach's workmates had already bandaged his badly injured hand. I don't know if my pinky's gone. Um, no, your mate's no probably all in a bag for us. Let me put my pinky in a bag. Put his pinky in a bag. How do you feel about it? You cut the tissue. Oh, I've lost my fingers. I don't care at this stage. The emergency team must move fast. The priority is to prevent blood loss and infection, which causes damaged flesh to die. What do you do for a living? Uh, I make doors. Not anymore. All I know at the moment is a young man has uh, put his hand into a machine or something. He's lost a lot of skin and tissue off his fingers. One of my colleagues is in there with him at the moment. I'm just going to go and see how he's going. Arms are most bad from what I understand. G'day. Zach, I'm Mark. Nice to meet you, Mark. One of the other doctors. You've got a lot of doctors. You'll meet a lot of us today. <laughs> you've had a pretty bit of a... popular right now. Yeah, you're pretty popular right now. You don't ever be popular with doctors if you can avoid it. You've had a bad morning. Yeah. What happened to you today? Uh, cleaning a glue roller at work. Yeah. Yeah. Glove got caught in the roller. Ah, yeah, okay. That was, yeah. That was it. Did you get yourself out? Or? Yeah. yeah, good. It was feet up against the thing oh, as hard as I could. I, I, it was that or I lose my hand. It was just, I'd like to say quick thinking, but it wasn't quick thinking because it was the only option. But it was like, if I'd left it any longer, I don't know if I'd have a hand necessarily. So I got lucky. As lucky as this can be. <laughs> Zachary reacted pretty quickly. He put his feet up against the side of the machine and just pushed hard, pulled himself out, which was a, a life-saving decision. You've done well. You've saved your own life there. <sighs> he left behind a good deal of tissue from his fingers and, I mean, potentially hand-losing injury. What the doctors can do to save Zach's hand will depend on what they find under the bandage. <laughs> Sorry, mate. That's it's all right. Do whatever you go, holy f shit. Melbourne Emergency Department, factory worker Zach is in shock after seeing his horrific injuries for the first time. I'm not saying you could have made it feel worse. Right? Sorry for swearing. The skin and flesh were ripped from his right hand when it got caught in machinery. Uh, it's a devastating injury and a terribly frightening event too for a young person, for anybody. Some people really feel like they need to see it and, you know, it's their body. They're going to have to come to terms with it sooner or later. Do I have a pinky? Yeah. I do? All right, well, that's... Can you stick with it? Yeah, I'm wide awake. I'm not going to sleep anytime soon. As doctors assess the extent of the damage, Zach is only now beginning to process the enormity of what's happening to him. They're gone. 
What are the chances of me keeping my fingers? I mean, it's pretty lot, low. It'll be a lot of operation, yeah. if I'm going to be honest, OK? And in terms of what we have to do, in terms of functionality after all the operation, it's, it's going to be very... It, it'll take a lot of rehab to get to a functional level. Yep. Uh -huh. He's got a tough time ahead. A lot of it will depend on which fingers he loses and what kind of mentality he's got to about life. Some people will, you know, just really hit a dead stop with this sort of thing for years and really struggle to recover. Other people lose a lot and get on with it. We don't know what's in us really until it happens. So it was only my fingers that are broken. Yeah. I think just the fingers that are affected. Uh, I did even say that the bones and the tendons were intact. Yeah, that's what that's they said. Good. There's a lot of extraordinary things to be done by the plastics team, the grow parts of the body, but the longer things are exposed to the outside world that aren't meant to be, like bone and nerve, the more infection is likely to set in, and infection will really be the enemy of uh, successful salvage of that hand. Oh. Hello, Michelle speaking. Yes, see it is well pressures. Yeah, that's fine, I can order that. Dr. Michelle Thornhill has been an emergency physician at the Royal Melbourne for the last five years. Her first job was a baptism of fire. Back in the Caribbean, the first job I got was in the emergency department. And on my first day, a bomb went off in the capital and we were flooded with patients with injuries from this bomb and it was organized chaos that really got the adrenaline flowing, and from that point on, I said, emergency medicine is definitely for me. Dr. Michelle's next case is 30-year-old, heavily pregnant Freya, who's been brought in experiencing extreme pain from a badly dislocated shoulder. How many weeks pregnant are we? 31 and a half, all right. Freya's mum, Janet, is by her side. She's anxious because her daughter is soon to give birth to twins, and any medication Freya may need could harm the unborn babies. She is my only child. It's awful just being around when your, your child's in pain. Get the hand over, see what's happening. Fraser's mm -hmm. a 30 year old female. Um, she had a right shoulder dislocation about four months ago, was cleared to exercise. This afternoon at about two o'clock, was swimming in the pool. She's felt it come out, felt it pop. She said that she's aware of the sensation and the discomfort due to the history of the recent dislocation. After a quick swim, Freya wants to have a special night out with her mum to see Harry Potter the stage play. But now, their plans are in jeopardy. Freya, hi there, my name is Michelle. I'm one of the emergency doctors. From what I heard, this has happened once before, about four months ago. Yeah. I've been seeing a physio. Okay. He gave me the go ahead to swim. I have been swimming a bit. Okay. Months, but I, I, is, can I get something else? Yeah, definitely, please? definitely. Shoulder dislocation. It's that really acute, severe pain, and it just fires the nerves. So everything around there is really angry until it gets back into place. And while she's in this much pain, the babies will be feeling the distress that she is in. To put her dislocated shoulder back into place quickly, the team need to sedate Freya. But giving pain relief to a pregnant woman is risky because the babies will be affected by it too. So That's deep it. Breath in, okay? so, so deep breaths. What I like to do is use the least invasive method first. Nitrous oxide's fairly simple, laughing gas. A lot of people know about it. It is used in pregnancy. Are you going there, Freya? Dr. Michelle hopes the nitrous oxide will give enough pain relief so they can pull Freya's shoulder back into place. Squeeze, that's it. Yeah, you can squeeze as hard as you want there. I think Freya right now is out of her mind. It's severe pain. I think she's probably thinking this is worse than the labor she's about to go through as well. Right now. Oh. 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 
letting go. The nitrous oxide isn't enough to deal with Freya's pain. Her arm's still dislocated, so Dr. Michelle makes the tough decision to use an intravenous anaesthetic. I'm going to just put that oxygen back on. What we'd want to do is give her the smallest dose possible, just enough to relax her, make her feel comfortable. If we give her something too large, just like anyone else, it'll relax her totally. It will stop her from breathing. And if that happens, Freya's unborn babies would be deprived of oxygen, putting their lives at risk. Once I've done the ultrasound, I'll sit you up, matey, OK? In trauma room one, Dr Emma West is still trying to assess her aggressive patient, who's under police guard. The stabbing victim was attacked with a long blade and may have life-threatening internal bleeding. Surgeons are standing by, but they need conclusive ultrasound results before operating. We will in just a second, OK? Uh, hold on. The pictures, yeah. There's a little bit of free fluid there. Oh, mate, please. So there is a little bit of free fluid. All right, matey? Yeah. Off the chip. Hey, mate, I reckon you've been stabbed in the belly and I reckon it's popped into your tummy and I reckon it's bleeding. You'll get sick and die if you don't have an operation. We're going to knock you out for an operation. Give me a drink first. No, not at the moment. We can't do the operation again. We'll bring your stomach. I'll give you some rice. Here you go. I don't want All yours. The team deny the man a drink, as the fluid could end up in his lungs, and he could choke to death. I just need to drink it, and I won't. I will help me I'm out. I'm happy to give you ice. There isn't anything else we can do. Give me a drink. The patient is becoming increasingly aggravated. If things get out of control, we have to be careful for our staff safety to make sure that everyone's safe and the patient's safe. I know he's been stabbed and I know he's bleeding internally and I know that he's not able to make the right decisions for himself and so my job is to take control of the situation, so take the choice out of it for him. Dr Emma makes the decision to sedate him. I'm giving you some medication through the drip, OK? It's called ketamine. Have you heard of that before? No. It makes you feel a bit weird, but we're here to look after you, all right? Oh, we're going here. Hope not. We're, gonna, we're here to look after you, mate. This man needs sedation and he needs a drug that won't affect his blood pressure and heart rate. So I've given ketamine. You just relax. I'm just going to lean you back a little bit. Not too far. No, Good. Please. I've gained control of the situation now, but I get the feeling that I can't just relax. Whoa. Yeah, like All right, yeah. All right, code break, please. Uh... You just relax. I'm just going to lean you back a little bit. Like All right, code break, please. In the emergency department, Dr Emma West has called for urgent help with her out-of-control stabbing victim. So I need you to hold him down. So I'm going to give him a couple of milligrams of Midaz. I think he's having emergence reaction from the ketamine. You hold his arm down. Where's that Midaz? Good. It's taken six security staff and police to restrain the aggressive man. When he jumped off the bed, I screamed out for some help, called a code grey, and I knew that would result in security staff who were expert trained at helping me hold down a patient like this so that I can give him sedation so that he can get urgent care that he needs. You've got 10 and 10 there. Thank you. It's all right. It's OK. He's an injured man. We just need to be really safe with him. And he's had some medications that have... Excuse me? He, he, won't, he won't listen to you. He's because he's really sick. Oh. So I need to put a drip in there. I need okay. So hold him okay. there and hold that arm out. Good, thank you. Oh. The sedation is beginning to kick in, but its effects will only be temporary. So, 
I think if we wait for his sedation to wear off, he's going to wake up and just be really, really difficult. So I think we need to get control of the situation. We can't reason with him. We can't get him to lay flat. We can't get him to do what we need. So I think we're going to have to intubate him now. You've got theatre ready? Uh, they are aware. OK. In order to keep the man unconscious, Dr Emma decides to take over his breathing and put him into an induced coma. I was trying to meet him and talk to him so that maybe he felt that he had an ally, but his brain wasn't working that way because drugs, alcohol... I can see untitled face. Yeah, there is. I see no. Yeah. <laughs> With the patient now under control, Emma's job is done. Whether he lives or dies is now in the hands of the surgical team. I think you should start rolling. And there's lots of blood in his belly. As he leaves the emergency department and heads upstairs to theatre, Emma's intense shift ends with paperwork before she can clock off. My drive home is a little bit of wind down time. Things percolate through your mind. You think about the case for a bit and you think, could I have done that differently? Or did they get enough pain relief? So it's just that 45 minutes I find so important because then I walk into the whirlwind of four kids all wanting my attention as soon as I walk in the door. And, you know, I'm their mum, so I have to be 100% ready for them too. Over in the resuscitation unit, heavily pregnant Freya is still in excruciating pain after dislocating her shoulder. We will drop some fentanyl. Dr Michelle Thornhill has been forced to sedate the 30-year-old with intravenous anaesthetic. But there could be serious implications for Freya's unborn twins. So this sometimes stings just a little bit going up the arm. There is a risk with anaesthetic, and it is a fine balance to get you just relaxed enough, but breathing on your own so we can get things done, and a little bit more, and you go to that point where you stop breathing. It'll be a few minutes before the anaesthetic can take effect. Mum Janet is still hoping they can make it to the stage play they bought tickets for several months ago. Do you live in Melbourne? No, we're both visiting to go and see Harry Potter tonight. Oh, how exciting. Oh. So you think it's a possibility? We'll see. We'll try our best. Could you open your eyes for me? With her patient now asleep, Dr Michelle watches Freya's vital signs closely. Any change to blood pressure or heartbeat could signal the babies are in distress. For a joint like your shoulder, all we do is gentle, controlled traction. Doesn't need to be too hard. Oh, 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 oh. oh, that looks much better. There we go. We've done very well. So her shoulder's looking good. Much better, not deformed anymore. You did really well. How's your shoulder feel? With the shoulder back where it belongs, the young mum comes out of anaesthetic with a major concern. I'm the making an ultrasound yeah. just to check that, the, that there wasn't any impact. Freya was obviously wanting to see a bit of movement because she couldn't feel it, babies. Freya's desperate to know if the anaesthetic has affected her unborn twins. I'll get the ultrasound around, yeah, and we'll have a look, okay. It's late afternoon, and an air ambulance is arriving from country Victoria with a seriously injured car crash victim. The injured man is one of more than 500 patients airlifted to the Royal Melbourne Hospital each year. Got it? Awesome, sorry, awesome. 23-year-old Jack was trapped in his ute for nearly an hour, and paramedics suspect he has fractured bones and a dislocated hip. So treating him is time critical. What's his name? Hi, Jack. Hi, Jack. I'm Jason. I'm one of the doctors. Hello. So I'll be looking after you today. 
Dr. Jason Gabriel Anasaw needs to quickly assess if Jack's injuries are life-threatening. Everybody ready? It's my hurt a little bit, OK? Mm -hmm. Ready, set, go. Good work, Jack. Ah. Oh, it's just my f***ing hip. This is uh, Jack. He's driving on a 100k zone area um, in, a, in an older style ute. Uh, has left the road and hit a large uh, post, hit it head on. Uh, trapped in the vehicle for a long period of time. When we finally got him out and onto the stretcher, basically his left leg was, was uh, extended up in that position. And can you remember what happened? When's that? In the accident. You've had a car accident, so you've been brought by helicopter to the Royal Melbourne Hospital. <laughs> oh, you're kidding. So you can't remember anything? No. First thought, the obvious thing is he's got hip pain, so he's got potential for internal injuries. We'll get some x-rays now um, to have a look at that left hip where he seems sore and he can't really straighten, um, to look and see if he's broken anything or if he's dislocated anything. This hip is dislocated, Jack. Feels all right. So we're going to give you some medication to make you a bit sleepy so that we can pop it back in, OK? Putting a hip back in place is a difficult and risky procedure. So Dr. And calls his supervisor, Dr. Maya Kubert, to meet him in trauma for help. The man in trauma one has got a dislocated hip. Unlike Freya's shoulder dislocation, which needed gentle realignment, Jack's hip may require brute force, and there's a real danger of further injury. Right. This looks unhappy to yeah. me. We are looking at an X-ray where his hip is clearly dislocated, but he's also had quite a significant injury where he's been in a car accident, he's had a period of time and trapped in the car, so we know we need to pull this hip and put it back in, but what we don't know is is there any other injury that we will potentially make worse? Ah. Oh, my God. It's been two hours since Dr Mark Putland's patient, factory worker Zach, arrived at emergency. The 23-year-old ripped the flesh from his hand while pulling it free from heavy machinery. You've done well. You've saved your own life there. Oh. What are the chances of me keeping your fingers? Zach's workmates recovered his skin and saved it in a plastic bag. <laughs> that quick thinking means Dr Will Alexander and the plastic surgery team may be able to graft Zach's skin back onto his fingers. Plastic surgeons are needed to do a lot of work with this because they don't want to try and salvage as much useful the limb or whatever as they can, especially with hands. Any finger segment that's salvaged is an advantage to the patient. Take the piece of skin and see if we can find some arteries and veins without to put it back up to yours. Mm -hmm. Given the mechanism, it's probably unlikely we'll be able to do that yep. when they get ripped. And if we can't do that, we actually just make a little pocket in your tummy skin, bury your fingers in that and leave that there for two or three weeks, then gradually oh, divide fingers at a time. True. Yep. That sounds cool. Yep, so that's another option. It's a bit more old-fashioned, but yep. it works. <laughs> Whatever, man. Try and save me fingers, please. We're going to throw the kitchen sink at you. Let's have a go. And try and do what we can. Please yeah. do. Zach will be on his way to theatre soon, where surgeons hope they'll be able to reattach his salvaged skin. I'm going to take your fingers up and start having a look at them under the microscope now. Okay. I'll see you up there. Okay, good man. As Dr. Will heads upstairs to prepare for surgery, Zach's family arrive to offer support. Thank you for It's an overwhelming and confronting reunion for Zach's mum, Linda. It's very lonely being a patient. You feel uncertain about what's going to happen. You have to make a lot of decisions. People come and talk to you about a lot of things you've never given any thought to before. It's just such a surreal. 
It's really nice to have someone who cares about you around. It makes a big difference. All right. We're off. We're going. Yeah, I'll see you later. Love you. Love you too. It'll be up to team now really do what they can to salvage his hand or as much of it as they can. It might take a number of operations to conclude the whole thing. Have you had any alcohol or other drugs today? It's not a problem. I just need to know so yeah. that I can give you the right things. Okay. That'd be last night before bed, that was it. Back in trauma room one, Dr. Maya Cubitt is assessing 23-year-old car crash victim Jack after his ute slammed into a pole. He's been given pain relief, but his dislocated hip needs urgent attention. So the hip is this little ball that sits inside a socket like oh, yeah. that, and yours is sitting out. It's a really common thing that happens when the dashboard pushes against your knee, pops it out the back. Feels like a prick of a thing. There is always a risk in a hip dislocation that if we don't manage it in a timely fashion, the part of the body that has been moved is at risk of not having enough blood supply to remain viable. In other words, the bone dies. All right, so, so CT first. OK. Before attempting to pull the hip back into place, Dr. Meyer needs a detailed scan to make sure Jack has no other internal injuries. We don't want to try and pull it. If there's any chance, we will move things around or damage his pelvis. Looks like he's taken a chunk off of his femoral head. It's bad news. The scan reveals Jack's thigh bone is fractured. Which could make it a bit trickier to try and pop it back in. Jack's returned to the trauma room, where he can be sedated ahead of the procedure. All right, Jack, gonna drift you off to sleep now, OK? In a patient like this, who's young, healthy, with large muscle mass, we know going into it that it will require a significant amount of sedation. Good idea. Started, not started? Uh, just drifted off. Dr. Meyer has called in extra help to attempt the physically difficult hip relocation. So there's two people pulling in exactly opposite directions. One pushing down to keep the pelvis down and one pulling up to pull the hip joint back into place. You can imagine to get it go back in requires a lot of force because at that point, once it's out, the muscles around it spasm. So what we're trying to do is to use drugs to relax the muscles and the body. But there are risks with giving sedatives. Jack could stop breathing. Just another 50 of propofol. Uh. Are you in? The team's struggling, so veteran emergency doctor Jonathan Papson arrives to give them a hand. Jack's a big guy, so when I go in there, I, my eyes are rolling in my head thinking, oh, this is going to be hard work. Do you want me to press on the pelvis? Yeah. Okay. yeah. Do you want to move him over a bit, guys? Yeah. Do you want the bed down? Go yeah. for it, go for it. Uh, you're just going to the end. Yeah. Push them both together. Oh, it's wrong in the way. I'm ready to see him. Hello, Freya. Hello, Dylan. How are you feeling, sweetheart? Heavily pregnant Freya's fully awake following the procedure that pulled her dislocated shoulder back into place. Dr. Michelle Thornhill and her team can now perform an ultrasound to check if the unborn babies have been affected by the anaesthetic. And don't forget, they might be a little bit sleepy at the moment with that medication we gave you. It's a nervous wait for Freya and her mum, Janet. That's a limb stretched out somewhere. You're getting some movement there. So I think you're good. <laughs> So I put the ultrasound on her belly. You see them moving and kicking and doing their thing. And we know that's our marker saying that they're fine. How are you feeling? Um, yeah, yeah heat's better than it's 
incomparable. Yep. And the kicking again. And the That's kicking the again. The kicking again. <laughs> it's good news for everyone. Frey's mum is hoping they can see the Harry Potter stage play in a couple of hours. I've come with Frey for her last sort of hurrah before she becomes a mum herself. And um, because she grew up very much obsessed with Harry Potter, we thought we'd make the effort to come to the musical. While Freya must be kept under observation for the next hour, Dr Michelle hopes she's done enough to get the pair to their big night out in time. I myself am a Harry Potter fan. I'm booked in to go see the live show in a couple months. It was somewhere in the back of my mind. <laughs> I thought if we can get this done quickly, get her recovered well, then she should be fine for the show. We'll see. Back in Trauma 1, a team of doctors and nurses are still struggling to get car crash victim Jack's hip into its socket. When we go into a procedure like this, there's a risk we won't be able to move it back into the right place. Dr Jonathan Papson throws himself into the task, but he's worried time is running out. You need to see to the hip dislocation quickly, because if it's out of the socket for too long, the hip head will actually degenerate. He's going to have a wrecked hip. He won't be able to walk. Oh, I can have a go. Sometimes, just some other position, isn't it? Sometimes. Ah, oh, here we go. Yeah. I think so. Yeah, it feels it clicking. Yeah, it's clicked. Oh, it worked. Good job. It's physically difficult to do. We effectively have to fight against the muscles until we find the right position where it clicks back. So that's what we're doing, which is hard because he's a strong guy. So we just want to re-X-ray it, make sure it's actually in. It felt like it clicked back in. Sometimes they click in and they click out again, or they grate just on the edge and they don't actually pop back. But I definitely felt a pop, so confident. Dr. Jonathan appears to have finally gotten Jack's hip back in place. Need a new bag valve mask and I need an airway nurse, please. But without warning, there's a new, potentially fatal complication. Jack has stopped breathing. Can you hook me up a CO2 that's in line? Are you okay? He is flat as a pancake. Can you hook me up a CO2 that's in line? Are you okay? He is flat as a pancake. Doctors Maya and Jonathan are trying to save their critically ill car crash victim, Jack. He stopped breathing after being heavily sedated to reset his hip. The real problem now is that he's not breathing because we've given him so much sedation. So we just need to support his breathing until the anaesthetic wears off, essentially. To relocate a hip is a big deal because you need to deeply sedate the patient and the deep sedation of a trauma patient is very dangerous. Um, so you all right? Started to breathe up on his own. Yeah, look at that, there we go. With Jack breathing again, the team can check if his hip is definitely in its socket. Yeah, we're OK. I think we're OK to put it back on. So I can call a mobile X-ray. We can check this is yeah. in. If it's not in, we can keep playing, I guess. Um, yeah, that'll be fun. The team anxiously wait for the X-ray. It's the moment of truth. Is the hip back in place? Oh, beautiful. Beautiful. It's all good? Yeah. You're good. So it's back in the joint now, at least. So it's not dislocated anymore. Now that Jack's awake again, he can have friends visit. You can't lose in no time. Yes. Before her shift ends, Maya debriefs with Jonathan. Thanks, Jonathan. So uh, was the hip in? Yeah, the hip's in. Yeah, thank God for that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> What was your technique, Doctor? Uh, it's just the, 
give us your, give you. us your learning. Uh, no, look, I, I just uh, tried a few different angles. Yeah. And then it just kind of clicked. Yeah. Um, Thanks just for the right position, in. that's all right. Answer phone calls all day, put hips back in. What am I going to take? I'll take the hip any day. It's really satisfying to relocate a joint at the end of the day. Yeah, it's good stuff. It's nice to fix things. Heavily pregnant Freya was discharged from hospital in time to make it to the Harry Potter stage play that night with an intact shoulder. <laughs> and fellow Potter fan Dr Michelle took her daughter to see the show. Dr Emma's aggressive stabbing victim survived the violent attack. Thanks to her team in emergency, he was rushed to surgery where the internal bleeding was stopped and his stomach repaired. He spent a few days in hospital before checking himself out. He didn't return for any of his follow-up appointments. Zach's hand was ripped apart when he tore it free from heavy industrial machinery at work. We're going to throw the kitchen sink at you so the way. and try and do what we can. Please yeah. do. That'll pop in the back and then you just screw them on. It's one week later and Zach's still in hospital. A bit tricky with one hand. His sister Georgia is a constant visitor. It just clips in or No, but I mean, apparently it does now. <laughs> that works. <laughs> The young factory worker has already had two marathon surgeries in the ongoing fight to save his hand. So they reattached my pinky, put the skin back on and all the flesh, just hoping that it would take. They took some veins from my foot to help get blood flow. Um, I can't remember how many days after, maybe four or five, they did another surgery. All the flesh had died practically, so they stripped it all back the bone again um, and put it inside of my groin. So it's, yeah, I don't know. It's pretty crazy what they can do with medicine. They're going to grow my fingers back. Right-handed Zach still has a long way to go physically and mentally. The impact on his life and livelihood will be huge, but he still has more good days than bad. I've been absolutely miserable a couple days, but it's, I know that if I don't keep my morale up, it's just going to get worse. I need to stay positive. So all the nurses and doctors, they're working their magic to hopefully save my fingers, so I'm not gonna complain. I have a job to do and I have to be there for them and they need to know that I really care. You're in a uniquely privileged position and I think that's incredible. Wednesday. His right kidney is shattered. And AFL players live. Seeing him playing down. Hands. I just had to say goodbye. In the balance. He's actually stopped breathing now. Stop breathing. Charge at 200. The everyday heroes of Melbourne's real life ER. You take a piece of a person that's broken and you put it back together. together. New Emergency. Next Wednesday on 9.